Well, good morning to you all. Oh, I've been away a bit, and I can tell. Good morning. Well, that's a little better. Aren't holidays good? Holidays to me are just wonderful. Mine was really good. I saw family, yay, that I haven't seen in a long time because of COVID. There was lots of heat. In fact, the first week of my holiday, like I never complain about heat, but it was too hot. Like whatever, it got 38, 42 here. It was just crazy. And it was almost too hot for me. And I got a sunburn at uh, White Rock in BC on the beach. And uh, my daughter Kylie's here and I, her and the girl, her girls and I went to the beach. And uh, I know I had suntan lotion. In fact, I even lent it to her for her kids. And why I didn't think I needed it. We're like that, aren't we? Oh, I don't need it. I'm okay. I'm strong enough. My skin will just like reflect the sun or whatever. And I also slept lots. And uh, I think some of the brownness has disappeared, but uh, yeah, no, it was a good holiday. And uh, this Sunday, just before we get going, it's the last Sunday to register for Global Leadership Summit. Uh, that's coming up this week. And if you want to do that, please go see Pastor West today. It's your last chance to kind of get there. Let's bow our heads and pray. Heavenly Father, oh God, you are a good Good God, so loving, so kind. And you desire intimacy, relationship. <laughs> you want to lead us and love us into uh, great things for the kingdom and great things for us. And so, Father, as we go into your word today, let it just be powerful. <laughs> let it be revealing. Uh, let your word just touch in those places of our heart where we've created barriers and doors and, and we just don't want to see in there. We don't want to experience what we need to experience. Oh God, uh, break down the strongholds. Break down anything that's against the true knowledge of you. In Jesus Christ's name I pray. Amen. Now last week, uh, Pastor Caleb, and that followed uh, Pastor Caleb and Pastor Rod, and then me preaching back a while, we've been in the book of 2 Corinthians, and it's been a fun ride uh, going through that. Uh, I love both the Corinthians, both the book, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians. They have so much stuff. You know why it's really good stuff? Because it was written to a broken church. And let's be honest, every church is a little bit broken because we're full of broken people. We all come out of sin in the sinful world. And so when I go through 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians, I always really love what it teaches because it's such a good corrector. And especially if, just some background here on the city of Corinth. Uh, the city of Corinth, <coughs> about 100 years or so before this book was written, the city of Corinth was, uh, well, basically the Romans came in and completely destroyed it. There was, there was a, a temple uh, to the love goddess. Uh, they destroyed that. Uh, they destroyed every building in the place. In fact, uh, there's even some talk that maybe they put salt on the ground so nothing would grow. And then what the Romans did is they rebuilt it. And you might sit there and go, well, this is a great book. We learned so much. Well, it was built after Roman ideals, Roman gods, Roman order, Roman rules, the rule of law. And so it was written to a people that uh, very easily could slide into uh, what we call today legalism. It's uh, written to a people that really like things systematic and orderly. And you're going to see that come bubbling out in the text today. And, and last week, Caleb talked about how we're in a spiritual battle, uh, that Satan wants to, uh, and if you remember last week, uh, there's a guy that needs discipline in 1 Corinthians. And then in 2 Corinthians, Paul's going, like, forgive him. And Caleb talked about forgiveness quite a bit last week. And the text goes on to say, it really is blunt. You know, sometimes, so they disciplined this guy. They, they wanted him to be righteous and true. And he repented. Reading 2 Corinthians chapter 1, he repented. And what did the Corinthians do? No, he still needs to suffer some more. If we don't ever exercise love in what we do, 
we will, as the text said last week, we will easily fall into the devil's trap again. We might think we're being really good, really right. I mean, we've got to deal with that man, that corruption, that person, that character. But friends, we've got to do it in love. We've got to have love in the church. It's so important that we have love. And so upon that background, um, I just want to say, just as we get in, because this really does fit into the message, do I look any slimmer? Okay, I am so chubby that it takes a while to look slimmer, but I've lost 22 pounds. I'm always reluctant to say it. In fact, even my doctor a month ago, I didn't want to tell her because, you know, you, this is my fifth, like, try. And I thought, okay, I've got to do something different. So my wife went through and is just recovering. She had a whole bunch of medical issues going. Some of them looked really dreadful. And so it really gave her a wake-up call and a scare, too. And we looked at each other one day, and, and uh, you know, my doctor will say to me, you should exercise 30 minutes a day. And I go, yeah. She said it to my wife, and my wife looked at me and said, we're going for a walk. So we've been walking 30 minutes a day whenever we can work it out, and uh, we started eating better. Now, I'm not on a diet. I I'm just eating better. It doesn't mean that, I mean, we had some ice cream sandwich cake last night, and uh, it doesn't mean that I don't eat some of that kind of stuff, but I'm just eating better. Here's the thing. I went to the doctor last Friday. She actually had to half one of my blood pressure medications. And I sit there and go, it, it's sort of like the sunburn. Like we literally eat ourselves to death or, or we just feel so miserable like, I can't get up the stairs. I don't know what to do. What's going on? My body, I'm getting so old. And it is true, I'm getting old. But why do we do this? Now, I'm going to flip this and switch this into our spiritual walks. We often, I mean, I end every service with body, soul, and spirit. We often get so sick feeling in our soul, and we go, what? I'm not putting suntan lotion on. I'm not going for that walk. Or, or change food, well, you know, you only live, eat, and be merry, for tomorrow we die, right? What is with us? Why do we have to be like, and, and again, I love the book of Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, because it talks to real people with real struggles. Have you ever thought about how you appear to others. Now, after talking about a diet, obviously, looking in the mirror, it's like, how do you appear to others? I don't like mirrors. I never liked mirrors. Most of us don't like mirrors. And honestly, when, when I ask the question, how do you appear to others? And in fact, in the text today, it's going to say, how do you smell to others? And the thing is, there's two reactions to that. I've seen some people when it comes to how others look at them, they go, I don't care what anybody thinks. I'm going to be like dressed grossly and provocatively, whatever. I'm just going to do what I want. I'm not going to wear a suntan lotion. I'm going to eat and eat and eat. I'm never going to exercise. I'm talking spiritually and figuratively here. We're just so much like that. We're, we're in such a bad shape. And, and people see it. They look at us. Now, now, again, flipping this over into the spiritual life, when people look at you spiritually, when they look at the fruit of the Spirit in your life, love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, do they see any of it? I mean, hopefully, I haven't lost enough weight to anybody to notice yet, but hopefully people will start to notice that know me, and they go, hey, what's going on? And I will ask you, and, and for me, about three years ago, there was a spiritual awakening that happened in my soul. And there was a bunch of events for the two years before that that took place, but here's what really began to change. I began to go for a walk every day for 30 minutes. What I'm talking about, I began to spend time with the Lord like an air. I mean, as a pastor, I went through the motions, I did the religious thing, I read the Bible, you know, picked out some good theology, some steps that, you know, the church could do or the people could do, but it really wasn't speaking to me. I, I really, and, and you need to know, I'm so ashamed and so embarrassed, and I've told you this before, that I have always heard God's voice. 
My theology kind of got in the way of it for a long time until church renewal and, and uh, Pastor Ray doing this, uh, the uh, steps, the six steps that we go through for hearing God. And, and as I went through that, and then I've taught it a couple of times, it's starting to embed in my soul. I'm so embarrassed because I've known this stuff. I've known how to walk with God. I, I've known how to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And, and I knew all that. Attempt number five, number 10. I knew all that, but three years ago, something just took off in me. I got an email about three weeks ago from somebody who used to attend the church years ago, and they were watching us online. And uh, they said to me, and it and doesn't matter what it means or, or anything, but you'll hear when I say it what I mean. The person said to me, you've changed. And he meant it in a good way. He went on to explain it. And I go, oh, so what do you smell like? What's the odor you're giving off? Or are you just indifferent? You don't care what people think. Or you're a people pleaser. <coughs> and you please people so much that you can't even have an odor. You're just going to look and act like everybody else around you. First Peter chapter 1, verse 22, and this is before we get going anywhere. I, I just wanted to kind of lay the groundwork. Live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Or... or 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 7. Now, this is talking about church leadership, but it says about a church leader. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders. He must. Now, I want to say to you, now, don't get confused about this. This isn't about getting the world's approval. In fact, when we go through the text, you're going to see some people are going to see the exact opposite. We're going to reek to them. We're going to freak them out. And they're going to get angry. But friends, the world and how we present to the world, it's eternity at stake. Uh, it's your family. It's your spouse at stake. And my prayer is that I start hearing out of my children and grandchildren, he keeps changing. Because I have a living, active relationship with Jesus. And again, don't misunderstand me. We're not looking for the approval of, of man. Hebrews 11 is clear about that. But we're looking for a reputation that looks, acts, and smells like we're in a transformational relationship with the God who loved you so much that he sent his one and only son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you. So turn in your Bible, 2 Corinthians chapter 2. We're going to start at verse 12. And we're going to start off seeing in the very first part, and uh, it took me a long time to kind of tie this all together, why it's all written together. But we're going to start seeing in verse 12 that open doors are not always open doors. They're not always the path we take. And uh, e even this, if you would go through the uh, Hearing God seminar that we offer as a church, uh, you would hear one of the lessons really focuses on this, that just because a window's open or door's open doesn't mean you go through it. Now listen to what Paul says here in verse 12. Now when I went to Troas to preach the gospel of Christ and found that the Lord had opened a door for me, there's an open door, he walked through it, verse 13, listen to this, I still had no peace of mind, because I did not find my brother Titus there. So I said goodbye to them and went on to Macedonia. Now, we don't know a lot of the details behind this, but I can tell you that it was very important and a, and a priority and a, <laughs> a spiritual priority to Paul that he find Titus. Titus, his good friend. Titus, his partner in ministry. And so even though a door opened, as he looked around at the circumstances, as he heard the Spirit speak to him, he said, no, I need to go on. I need to go find Titus. <laughs> years ago, I was interviewed by a &W. I was 18 years old, and I was looking for my life. And uh, I went to the a &W in Fort St. John, and they were advertising uh, assistant manager trainee. So I remember going to the interview, 
And uh, I tried to, you know, sit forward in my chair and answer all the questions and tell them all the reasons why I'd like to be a manager. And uh, weirdly enough, uh, that was in the morning. By late afternoon, the guy phoned me and said, can you start tomorrow morning? And I was going, oh, oh my, oh my goodness. I mean, what 18-year-old wouldn't want to be a manager trainee, right? And so I said the weirdest thing to him. I said, this is going to sound really weird, but can I think about it for a night? Actually, what I wanted to do was pray about it for a night. So he said, okay, I'll hear from you in the morning. And that night, in my sleep, no, let me be honest, that night, I didn't sleep. I just had this, there, there was a door open, <laughs> but I just, just, I just had this sense there was something else I was missing. Something else I should do. Now, this was in about July, and I will tell you that by October, God began to manifest events that I go to Bible college. I still didn't know I was going to be a pastor then. But I just knew, because I'd learned enough about hearing God, I just knew that I wasn't supposed to do that. Now, normally if you go through the hearing God stuff, you'll, hear, you'll learn about testing, you'll learn about how Scripture speaks to you, you'll learn about open doors and whether they're really open or not, and it's really important to go through all that depth of that. But I wanted to say this today, that this, as Paul's going through and speaking to the Corinthians, he's trying to make a point He's trying to make a point about a walk with God that it's abiding, a walk with God that's alive, a walk with God where something cool and incredible happens all the time. And I want to tell you, if if I were to have started walking 30 minutes a day when I was still thin, when I got eating too much and I got stressed or whatever it is, or eating the carbs or eating out lots, which is a pastor that happens to me, I would have had all the tools to keep the blood pressure down, to keep the weight down. But you know what? We spiritually, we we get into crisis and we don't have a natural go-to thing that happens. We get in a crisis and we, we start to rely on the old methods and plans. Like if you have ever had a habit towards drink or marijuana, Suddenly you're smoking lots of marijuana, you're drinking lots, because you go to the go-to habits. I'm going to go tie one on so I feel better. Uh, I'm going to just go uh, get in a bar fight tonight. You know, kind of that mentality, instead of, as a Christian, if you're in a relationship with God, you're reading the Word, and you're not just reading it to get theology out of it, that's good, but you're reading the Word of God to see what it's saying to you, not to, you know, your friends and relatives and your children, but you're actually reading going, what, what's this saying to me? What's, what's my takeaway today? And so three years ago, I got so, so serious about, I mean, I have a, on my electronic device, if I go into my notes, I can find my journal. And I don't do it every day. I read my Bible every day. I hear from God every day. But I go into my journal and I write down what the Word of God spoke to me that day. What did it say? And sometimes I just go, well, it said this, but what in the world does that mean to me? And all of a sudden, the floodgates open, and God gives me understanding, and it fits so well. When we are in regular spiritual exercises and discipline, and I'm not talking about legalism, I'm talking about a walk with God, then things begin to happen in us. We get healthy. People start to notice. We get a different continence about us. We start to smell different. We start to look different. And please understand this. You need to keep these points in your mind as we get to the very closing verse. God wants you in relationship. He wants you to be walking with him. And a door might open, but do you have the kind of relationship that can discern and talk to God? Are you constantly hearing his voice? Are you, are you spending time? First thing in the morning, I get my cup of coffee and I get my Bible. Do you have a habit like that? And then usually... After that's done, I see my wife coming down the stairs. She, okay, time for a walk. What's your life like? I mean, when my wife and I go for a walk, there's so much relationship, so much talking, and I'm getting healthy physically. It's so good. Now, back to my opening question. What's your reputation, or figuratively, what do you smell like? What do you smell like? 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14. Let's read it. But thanks be to God, 
So he says, I decided not to go there. I want to keep looking for Titus. But thanks be to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphant procession and uses us to spread the, listen to this, the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. The aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. Now, many of us will read that and go, yeah, I, I, I'm reading that. The knowledge of, I need doctrine, I need to know who God is, I need to tell other people about who God is. But read it really close. The aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. In other words, you are what you eat. You, you have been soaking in the presence of God. He's been changing and transforming you. And, and, and even recently, I've had at least three people say to me, you have really changed in this, or you've really changed in that. I'm 60 years old, and I am ashamed to say that it's taken a long time that people are saying that more often to me. God wants to do a new work in you. And he wants to be in an intimate relationship with you. And the text gets even more exciting. It just goes on. <laughs> it's so good. Be, but thanks to God who always leads us as captives in Christ's triumphal possession and uses us to spread the aroma of the knowledge of him everywhere. For we are to God the pleasing aroma of Christ among those who are being saved. Did you hear that? Did you know when you walk out of here there's people that are being saved? And God's using you in that process, the way you behave, the way you act, the way you talk, the way you look, what your attitude is. They're for those who are being saved and those who are perishing. Oops, listen to how it explains it. To one we are the Roma that bring, brings death. I mean, they see your kindness, your love. I mean, have you ever experienced that where you're, like, like let's say you're at the, the till and the girl gives you too much money back and you, hey, here's a dollar back, you gave me too much, and she gets mad at you. I've actually had that happen. I, I don't fully understand that. But, or, or you're just in a good mood and, or, or maybe uh, something bad's happened to you. And I, when I was in the plane crash, I remember sitting down a few months later to a non-Christian person and they said, so how are you feeling? How are you feeling about the plane crash? And I'm like, oh, the Lord was so in it. And she looks at me and goes, how could the Lord be in that? You're crazy. I mean, just my countenance, my, my joy, my, my insight in my soul, it just rubbed her the wrong way. So to some people, we're, we're the aroma that brings death, and we got to get over that. Uh, you people pleasers, people pleaser, get over it. Let Jesus transform you. To the one, we are the aroma that brings death. To the other, an aroma that brings life. And who is equal to such a task? Unlike so many, we do not peddle the word of God for profit. <clears throat> On the contrary, in Christ we speak before God. This is really important. Pay attention closely. <laughs> On the contrary, so we don't peddle for the word of God. It's not all about me. It's not about Anthony be greater and Christ be less and please pay me some money. It's about Christ be greater and me be less. We speak before God, listen to this, with sincerity as, though, as those sent from God. We speak before God. There is a sense of, this isn't just reading the Bible for doctrine and theology. This isn't just saying prayers, give me this, give me that. This is an actual, I'm gonna be raw and honest with you for a moment, God. I'm, I'm really hurting. Or, or, God, I'm so excited, she's so cute. Or, or, oh, I love that new puppy you gave me. Or, it really is horrible. My transmission just went in my car and I have no money. Or, you know, you get the drill. The sincerity before God, a relationship with him, and then be quiet. Open up the word and thumb through it. And I, I often will get a sense, I need to go to this book or I'll get a sense like, go to your devotions today and read it again. You see, this is a living, breathing, acting, uh, brings life to the soul, gives you an aroma that to some is horrible and to some it's exciting and brings life. And speak with God with sincerity as those sent from God. Again, it's not about the world approving you, but our reputation will bring joy to some and death to others. 
when we behave in the fruit of the Spirit by having a relationship with God, we will impact those around us. The whole concept of the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Fruit comes from the inside out. Now, I would say all religions pretty much, eh, there's some that maybe uh, we can give them a little benefit of the doubt, but most religions it's about an external process to make us different on the inside. With God, it's about an inner transformation in a relationship that's going to change your outer performance. And I want to tell you, this is so critical and so important. I've said it over and over and over again over the 13 years I've been here. My wife informed me, we've just finished 13 years. Like, oh, okay, cool. But I want to say to you, (laughs) to walk in the Spirit... There's a smile on your face. And, and I will say, the one walking in the Spirit usually lives more righteous. And let me give you an example. The person walking in the Spirit. Now, I, I'm from Fort St. John, and we just send, tend to say things like it is. But that can offend people. But when you're walking in the Spirit, I, I don't walk around blundering, hurting people. I'll, often the Spirit will say to me, Anthony. Like, and it's sometimes like 20 minutes later, an hour later, I'm in prayer, or I'm just sitting there thinking... And all of a sudden the Holy Spirit says, you know, you need to go talk to so-and-so. You've offended them. And almost always it's right. And I'll go to them and say, you know what? I I just am sitting here thinking, and God's told me that I'm a buffoon. And, And they go, no, God doesn't tell you you're a buffoon. Well, to me it feels like that. And I'll say, I am so sorry. See, this is the aroma of life that the scriptures are talking about. We need to be in a relationship. We need to be connecting with him. We need to be letting the word feed us and transform us. We need to have God leading us so that a door that opens, we can go, okay, I'm not going to become that assistant and Who knows, I could own a chain of A&W restaurants, hey? Ah, what would that be worth? This is way funner. To some we are a source to others To some we are the source of life and joy, and to others it just shines up their rebellion or their sin, and it's really agitating, (laughs) especially with our fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, and kindness. The other day my wife, (laughs) she came up to me, she gave me a big hug, and she whispered in my ear, and she hasn't done this for a long time, but she said, you're a good man. She gave me a big squeeze. How do you think I took that? Get away from me. <laughs> it was beautiful. It was wonderful. I don't know if the Holy Spirit put it up, up to it or what, but my soul flipped. Hear this. We will be known by our fruit. We will be known by our fruit. Verse, verse 3 of chapter 2, uh, chapter 3. Are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? Another whole explanation, churches used to do that. People would travel around and they needed to have a letter of recommendation in order to go to another church. Listen to what he says. You yourselves, here's the fruit of the Apostle Paul and the work he did. You yourselves are our letter written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. This is the odor that Paul gave off. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit. Remember the audience, the Roman audience, the regimented ritualistic Roman people, and especially Paul, who came out of the Hebrew faith. I mean, the letter of the law, I mean, uh, the Pharisees even added more rules to the law. I mean, there wasn't enough. And I want to be blunt with you, following legalistic rules, coming to church because you have to, instead of coming to the church to meet the Spirit of God and the Spirit of God in other peoples to get the aroma off them, to connect, I mean, It is death when you live by the law, by rules. It is life when you live by the Spirit. And I will say it again. When when we are living by the Spirit, we will look and act more righteous, more right than anybody else. Those that live by the law, they have a frown on their face. They're miserable. So let me ask you, do you need to go on a diet? Do you need some changes in your life? It's super important here. 
I, I mean, listen to what the text says. You show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, not written with ink, but with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of so, stone, but on the tablets of the human hearts. That's the inside-out relationship that you have with God. We are not a religion of legalistic rules. The world looks on the outside in at us, and sometimes we present that. And being a rule follower, I'm going to be honest, is easy. It's a lot easier than a relationship. Walking in relationship we have in Jesus is a lot harder because we have an enemy that will want to stop you from spending time with the Lord. Your schedule get interrupted, you go on holidays, whatever it is, and it's a lot harder, but it is life. My blood pressure medication dropped in half. I can go up a flight of stairs and enjoy it. Wouldn't you like your soul to feel better? When I first became a Christian, I told Jesus <laughs> that I was not really good. I told him I had done wrong and needed forgiveness from God, and, and I prayed the prayer, and I felt his presence and his holiness. And then I went out after that to be a Christian. Guess what? I failed. Miserably. I think within two years, it was in grade 12, I was starting to do drugs. I had stopped going to church. Um, I, I was wanting and desiring things that I shouldn't have. And I felt dark as black coal. And then I got the point in the sense, come back to Jesus. And I started to understand it's not about the rules. It's about the relationship. And I was being mentored by a youth pastor at the time, and it was so good. <laughs> and my life started to change. But I have struggled over and over at 60 years old to keep in this relationship with God. I have learned and continue to learn that my smell comes not from spending, uh, my spell comes not from spending time following rules and learning doctrine. Uh, my time and my smell doesn't come from learning more theology and just straight up Bible reading, but my smell and my odor comes from time hearing God speak to me when I read the Bible. My odor comes from me walking in the Spirit. And the choice is really simple. Rules <laughs> driven or spirit led? Are you rules driven or spirit led? Verse 4. I'm sorry, I get so thirsty these days. Maybe my cut medication will change that. Such confidence we have through Christ before God, not that we are competent in ourselves. You hearing that? Don't try to pull yourself up by the bootstraps. Don't try to follow the rules to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of the new covenant. It is not the Old Testament, the rules and the regulations. It's not all that kind of stuff. Not of the letter but of the Spirit. For the letter kills, but the Spirit gives. Have you ever heard this saying, um, not the letter of the law, but the Spirit of the law? I mean, I always thought it was a Bible verse, and I searched in the Bible, and this is the closest I could found. But that's not what this passage is saying. It, it isn't this sense of like, well, if we read the Old Testament, and we go through the Ten Commandments, let's not get into the letter of the law. Let's understand the Spirit of it. Now, what is the Spirit of the Ten Commandments? I, I don't know. Like, don't play that kind of flip and switch game. This is not what the passage is talking about. It really is saying rules kill, but a relationship with Jesus actually brings life. Beth Moore, doesn't matter what you think of her. Some of you may or may not like her because of some of her positions, but she wrote an incredible statement recently, and I have to read it to you, and we're going to be done soon, so don't worry. She writes. Now, she was writing about, she had a whole group of people that were being disciplined to be connecting with God in relationship with God, and she writes, amid my larger reading, I have taken care to pour over the Gospels with particular attentiveness because of the deep burning conviction in my spirit 
that unsettling numbers of our communities of faith have loosened, if not altogether lost, the most crucial aspect of discipleship. All spiritual formation is towards one goal. Listen, Christ-likeness. Not doctrinal purity, Christ-likeness. Not big churches, Christ-likeness. Not increasing numbers of baptisms, Christ-likeness. Likeness, not power and influence, Christ likeness. She goes on to say, doctrinal soundness and the study of scripture and theology and apologetics and the very filling of the Holy Spirit are all meant, to borrow the words of Paul, to grow us, listen to this, until Christ is formed inside of us. I think it may be fair to say that we, at least in the part of the Christian culture where I live and serve, have perhaps never been more educated theology, yet our witness is not marked by the fruit of the Spirit. The Gospels send us back to the cross, walk with Jesus, where we can see his ways and means and what drew him and recoiled him. We must return to them over and over throughout a lifetime in Bible study, reminding ourselves what our mindset is is meant to be. I love how Matthew begins and ends, God with us. He is with you, praying said. Let's end strong and bold. So in conclusion, what odor do you wish to have. And just because people are offended, that's sometimes a good thing. Number two, legalism kills. The law kills. Following a set of rules and guidelines kills. Learning just theology for theology's sake is empty. It all leads to Christlikeness. And the Spirit, friends, gives life. Galatians 5.16 says, So I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is contrary to the Spirit, and the Spirit what is contrary to the flesh. They are in conflict with each other, so that you are not to do whatever you want. You see walking in the Spirit, how different it is? I mean, I knew stuff as a new Christian that I'm only now learning in the Scriptures because I was walking in the Spirit. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Number three, final point, final question. What changes or new habits do you need to get the right smell? What do you need to do? Let's stop with the excuses. Ephesians 5.18 says, do not get drunk on wine which leads to debauchery, but instead be filled with the Holy Spirit. I love that juxtaposed in that passage. You know what wine represents? All the self-made, self-fix. I mean, the sake of wine, you know, I'm going to tie one on so I feel better, or I need some courage in this interview, or I, I just feel so un. Walk in the Spirit. Life or Death. What odor do you have? Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father. Oh, Heavenly Father, more of Jesus and less of me. More of Jesus and less of me. And Holy Spirit, would you speak to us? Would you move in us? Would we lay down our excuses? Would we... Would we see those walls torn down, those areas of our heart? We're not going to go there. We're not going to talk about that. And Holy Spirit in relationship. And and of course, right now, this Sunday service, even if somebody's, okay, I'm going to walk in the Spirit, but we need to start making time for you. We need to actually start like that 30-minute walk in the morning and, and start to grow it into hearing you in the whole day. Oh God, you want more of us. You want more for us. You want to give us life. And you want to take away the death that is all around us. The guilt, the condemnation, the rules. You want to take all that away. And you want to breathe life and power and strength 
and resurrection and new life and an eternal salvation into us. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen.